Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week we're gonna take a look at Windows Arm. We've been looking at a lot of laptops lately, including this lower cost Samsung that we reviewed the other day. And it's just not there yet. And we've been looking at this off and on over the last two years, and I'm not seeing a ton of progress here. So I wanted to dive into the topic of Windows Arm and see what Microsoft needs to do to get it to where Apple and some of these Chromebooks are headed. Let's get to it. Now, many people might assume that Microsoft has only been writing operating systems for Intel-based chips, but they've actually been developing their OSs for multiple platforms. And if you go back to Windows NT, they were making NT available on a number of different computing platforms to meet some of the needs of enterprise customers at the time. And they also uh, ported Windows over to ARM back in the early 2010s, and that resulted in Windows RT. And that's a version of Windows that was available on one of the original Surface devices. And one of the big criticisms of Windows RT, and you can see more about it in this video review from uh, the former Techno Buffalo folks, uh, the problem with Windows RT was that it did not run any of the Intel software. So unless a developer specifically ported their app to ARM, you couldn't run it, even though the computer had a Windows logo on it and had a version of Windows that looked identical to the one you would run on an Intel-based PC. And I think those compatibility issues combined with the fact that ARM processors at the time were not powerful enough to run Intel software kind of doomed Windows RT from the start. I did remember playing with this a bit because Microsoft was very aggressively marketing these Surface devices running RT. I remember walking through an airport and they had a whole display set up where they were grabbing people as they walked by to get them to try it, to try to convince them that perhaps having a limited Windows laptop was better than a full featured one. But again, it just didn't take off. Now, if we fast forward into the year uh, 2017, Microsoft announced that they were going to try ARM again. And the difference this time was that they were able to write an emulator that would boot up 32-bit, but not 64-bit, Intel code on ARM and allow it to run seamlessly. And it did do that fairly well, but unfortunately, it did have a performance hit. We reviewed one of the early versions of these ARM-based Windows machines back in 2018, the Asus Nova Go, and it was rather expensive. So for the baseline configuration, it was about $600. And in comparison, at that point in time, you could get a little Intel computer with similar specifications for half that price, and they performed about the same. And I think that was the big issue here, was that a lot of people expected something running with one of these ARM processors to cost less, but unfortunately it cost more. And of course you had compatibility issues with 64-bit apps that the cheaper machines running Intel could run just fine. And I think all along, Microsoft has had this chicken and egg problem because they need to get the hardware out there and then they have to have the hardware out there to attract the developers to put the work in to port their applications over. And that's kind of plagued Windows Arm from the beginning. And Microsoft has a lot of players in this effort and they have to figure out how to get all these different interests aligned so that they can get this moving. So let's take a look at what components make up Windows Arm. So you got Microsoft writing the operating system. Now Microsoft has to rely on Qualcomm to make the processors to run their operating system. It's a separate company. I'm sure Microsoft has given them some development money to focus on making PC chips, but for the most part, Qualcomm's money is made on smartphone processors, not on computers. So Microsoft is really going to have to figure out a way to make this in Qualcomm's best interest to really focus their development resources on improving performance. And as we saw in our review of the latest Snapdragon processor in the HP we looked at a few weeks ago, they're nowhere near where Apple is with their ARM development. And I think that's largely because Qualcomm is focused elsewhere. And then you've got the hardware manufacturers who make computers. Now, of course, Microsoft makes its own hardware but they do not have a significant market share. The Microsoft hardware is great. I love my little Surface Laptop Go that I have that's running Intel, by the way, uh, but they're just not selling in the kinds of quantities that they need to to have Windows on ARM become 
more than just a niche product. They have to get HP, Lenovo, and Dell to really invest some serious time, energy, resources, and marketing into developing ARM-based laptops to sell to people because right now they're either really expensive or a little more on the affordable side but very Spartan like the Samsung we looked at here with the lousy build quality. There just isn't a laptop that's comparable to like a mid-range Intel machine right now and that I think is holding things back as well. And these hardware manufacturers have to have a reason for making this stuff because right now people aren't buying Windows ARM laptops, they're buying Intel ones. And it's a much harder sell to convince a consumer to buy an ARM-based laptop because there are compatibility issues, especially with 64-bit software and a whole bunch of other factors that go into that sales process. And of course, you've got the enterprise market, which drives a lot of business for these companies. And enterprises certainly don't want to switch to a platform that's going to make rolling out computers to thousands of users more difficult. So if I can buy a ThinkPad and roll it out in 10 minutes or buy an ARM-based machine and get a ton of support calls, which direction do you think I'm going to go? And I think that is, in a nutshell, kind of where we're at with this. We've got Microsoft and kind of a half-finished operating system that's not fully compatible with all Intel software. We've got Qualcomm who has to make chips that are more powerful. And then of course we have the hardware partners that actually have to make this stuff and sell it. And it's really hard to get all of these different things rowing in the same direction. And there hasn't been a lot of competitive pressure to go to ARM until just recently when Apple rolled out the M1. And I suspect the industry was kind of taken by surprise by how powerful these M1 Macs turned out to be. I know I certainly was surprised. And Apple has a real advantage here in the market because they make computers and they make operating systems and now they make the chips that go into those computers running the operating system that they make. So Apple controls the entire stack and I think that gives them a tremendous competitive advantage and also higher profitability because they don't have to rely now on other companies to develop all of the hardware that they're eventually going to put together and sell. And of course, Apple has a lot of experience transitioning from one processing platform to the other. So of course, they started on Motorola processors on the original Macs. In the early 90s, they switched to PowerPC. Around 2006 or so, they switched to Intel processors. And now, of course, they've just switched again, or in the process of switching, to M1. And every time they've done one of these transitions, users have not been left behind. It's been a very seamless process. And I think Microsoft is trying to replicate that a bit, but their emulation layer wasn't ready by the time they started rolling these PCs out. And Apple, I think, waits until they've got it all in place and then makes the big transition. But I would also suspect that because Apple does switch their platforms from time to time, uh, they've really tailored their operating systems and their development tools to allow for that transition. And I think Microsoft having been so uh, embedded into the Intel architecture and customers just buying Intel computers only for all these years is making it a lot more difficult for Microsoft to follow the same path. Apple, of course, can say to its users, hey, after this update, 32-bit code isn't gonna work anymore, and Apple users just deal with it. Unfortunately, Microsoft's enterprise customers don't have the same uh, ability to absorb such news. And I think that's also part of this, that Microsoft has to really get this new technology working with a lot of legacy code. And I bet you that's really challenging, and that's something Apple doesn't have to deal with. Apple also has an API that is almost agnostic to the processor running it, and it's getting easier and easier for developers to port code not only between Intel and M1, uh, but also from Mac to iPhone and iPad as well. And I think all of that stuff comes together for a really successful rollout here. And these Apple chips are also very powerful, but I think the fact that Apple knows what developers are doing with their chips and how to optimize the chips for those use cases is what really makes this new platform so successful. And of course, it has the battery life too. Now, what really surprised me about this transition to M1 is that the Intel software on Mac, in many cases, runs better than what it did on a comparable Intel machine. We covered that in my review of the MacBook M1, and we showed how some games that barely ran on the Intel version of the MacBook Air actually run exceptionally well on the M1, even without the software optimized for the new processor. But one thing Apple has done very well is curate 
some of the apps that are in fact optimized for the M1 so users get a feel for what their computers can do and of course developers are incentivized to get their apps ported so that uh, they can get featured in the App Store like this and the same cannot be said of what we're seeing in the Microsoft Store here so I have uh, the Microsoft Store up on screen on our little Samsung device here and if we dive into it you really don't get a sense as to what's optimized for your computer or is just Intel code running in emulation and one of the problems of course with the current implementation is that the Intel code doesn't run as well on these Qualcomm ARM chips as it does on a real Intel processor so you're going to spend a lot of time downloading stuff and discovering it's not working all that great and there's no way for the user to kind of filter out which apps are compatible short of going into the screen uh, where the app is available and going to system requirements and then looking to see what processor it supports. I am though seeing a lot of apps that are compatible but again you've got to dig into it to see for sure. So for example uh, Netflix here if we click on that and go into system requirements will indicate to us that they have ported this across all of the platforms 32-bit Intel, 64-bit Intel, and ARM. And I think it would be really helpful to users for Microsoft to offer a filter so you can go through and find the software that is optimized for your computer. I have not been able to figure out a way to do that in their search here, and I think that would make a big difference in preventing some buyer's remorse, but also giving customers the ability to really get a feel for what this platform can do and I think it would encourage developers to start porting their software over uh, so that they could appear in those filtered searches as well. Now I'm sure Microsoft is avoiding this because they don't want to go back to the RT days where some things work and some things don't work at all. I think they want to have Windows just be a universal platform irrespective of processor and that will happen eventually but right now the shipping version of Windows 10 doesn't run 64-bit Intel code at all so it is a sort of bifurcated system already. So they may as well do that uh, to give some incentive for developers and I guess for customers uh, to kind of adopt the uh, ARM platform here and feel good about that decision. So hopefully they'll do that because I think ARM is important for all computing platforms and Windows of course is the biggest one that I think would benefit from it. Now we're also seeing ARM make its way over to Chrome OS and ARM Chromebooks have been around since almost the beginning of Chromebooks and of course many of these are running with cheaper MediaTek processors and the performance is more than adequate uh, especially for the price point that a lot of these ARM based Chromebooks are sold at. We've looked at a bunch here on the channel that are very affordable and very useful and of course you get the entire Android app library or at least most of it that runs on these low cost devices. And I think what's neat about Chrome OS is that it has been a multiple platform operating system from the beginning because many of the early Chromebooks were also running Intel chips. And as this transition to adding Android apps worked its way into the operating system, both Intel and ARM based Chromebooks can run much of the same software and the user doesn't really need to think about it at all. So that's kind of the real model here for how you can adapt an operating system for multiple processing environments. So given these competitive pressures, what does Microsoft need to be focusing on when it comes to ARM? Because right now, all they can really market to you on is battery life, and I think there's more to life than that. So let's take a look at some things that I think would really help. The first, of course, is going to require their hardware providers to get on board, but if they really want ARM Windows to be a thing, they should really focus on offering a number of affordable, thinner and lighter designs that take advantage of what an ARM-based architecture would allow for. Now we've seen that with the HP Folio, the Microsoft Surface X is a good example as well, but those are very expensive. I'm talking about the seven or $800 mid-range computer, the all metal two-in-ones and that sort of thing. We're not seeing a lot of choices out there running ARM just yet. Maybe we'll see some more soon, uh, but right now there's very few options between the super expensive stuff and the cheap stuff here. So I think that's going to be important. Uh, improving Intel compatibility is also critical, especially if Microsoft wants to sell Windows as a universal operating system. 
Right now on the shipping version of Windows 10, again, you can't run 64-bit code unless you install a less than stable beta version like I've got on this machine here. But the 64-bit code is not running terrifically yet. So there's a lot of work they've got to do there to get the Intel compatibility to improve so users can be assured their software is going to run. Uh, they also need to assist developers in developing ARM optimized code. Another chicken and the egg problem, right? Uh, and a lot of code has been written specifically for the things that Intel processors do. So porting that code is going to be really difficult unless they're coding at super high levels, which is something you might be able to get away with with a media player, but you're going to have a lot more trouble getting games to work in that universal fashion. So there's a lot of work that they have to do there to help their developers. And I think also we need to see more powerful processors. Apple is showing us what ARM can do. And right now, even the most powerful Snapdragons are just not benchmarking anywhere near their Apple competitors. So hopefully uh, that can be encouraged. And I'm sure Microsoft might have to put some money in to ensure that happens. But there's a lot here that I think has to happen uh, before these Windows-based ARM machines are going to be competitive. And Microsoft, of course, lost out on the entire mobile market, which is a huge industry. And I think they've really got to double down here before they lose market share on the PC side. So let me know what you think about Windows ARM down in the comments section. I would love to hear from all of you, especially developers who are struggling to port their code from Intel to ARM. Is it difficult? Is it easy? Let me know. I'd love to hear about that. So I want to thank uh, some super chatters this week for their support of the channel. Chanfle98, Prime, Just Vids, and Thomas Anfang all contributed during one of my recent live streams. And we also have a new supporter here on the channel who contributed via the YouTube membership program. Uh, that is Angel's Army. I am shooting this week's wrap up a couple of days earlier than I usually do. So if you don't see your name here, I'll get you next week. And I want to thank everyone who contributed this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too, because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution through my donor box page. We also support Floatplane, the YouTube membership program, and Patreon. We got a bunch of other channels that you can follow me on, including my Amazon shop, where we have a bunch of our reviews popping up there, uh, along with our live streams. And of course, we have an audio version of this show on my podcast, which you can find at the link you see on screen there. If you want to engage with the channel, you can go to lon.tv slash email for my very infrequent email list. I only let you know when we've got something special going on. We've got the Facebook group and we also have my store where we sell previously reviewed items that I purchased. And one of those items that will be going up shortly uh, is this Samsung ARM-based laptop. There's only one of everything and I sell them for lower than new prices because they have been used for review here and you can get alerted every time we add something to the store at lon.tv slash store alert. That's an email list separate from my other list. And every time I do make a change there, I send out a notice. That is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for your continued support and comments and feedback. You can let me know what you think as always down in the comments section below. Stay tuned for more reviews and more live streams. So set that notification bell. And until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Jim Callagher, Hot Sauce and Video Games, and Brian Parker. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.